Hey, cool. James, thanks for doing this today. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. So, I mean, we're just starting to get into a little bit, but I don't want to butcher your entire story. You've lived many lives, and you continue to, it seems like, reinvent yourself, goals, past learnings, to create amazing ventures as you would forward from the previous one. So I'm curious about, like, the high level of, of James before we get into, like, a lot of what we want to chat about today. Oh, well, I'm just the luckiest person who ever lived, right? I, I was the right age when the internet comes along in 94, and I was in my early 20s and was able to jump on that and start using that open creative canvas. Yeah. Uh, and then 14 years later, it comes along the mobile phone and creates this other giant canvas, and now we've got our third one, which is the AI revolution. And it's now this, this third giant canvas. And in each phase, the typically the low-hanging fruit sort of sits there for three to four years. This one might sit there for five years because it's just that much more complex. Right. Uh, but there's this wonderful open period of creativity we're in it right now. It's amazing. What was your headspace as everyone was interpreting what was going on with you know the internet coming out? Yeah, so that one was uh, pretty interesting because so many people didn't believe in the internet. It's hard to imagine now, but uh, there was one famous guy, Bob Metcalf, who said it was gonna be like the CB radio where it would come and go, it was just a fan. And a lot of people felt that way about it. And I think there might be 150 million people on the internet by 2000. There weren't that many people on there. Uh, it was pretty slow to adopt. And, uh, and so just watching people invent e-commerce, you know, being part of the uh, security things uh, with browsers, the search engines, like all the, the basic building blocks were being built. And uh, you, you could kind of see them coming. You, know, you could actually develop a thesis, even at that time, about what fundamental technologies would be, need to be a part of the internet for it to actually work. Mm -hmm. And so you could watch it roll out, and we did. And then, of course, the crash came, uh, and that gave everybody breathing for about three years. I mean, people forget, but really almost nothing went on for three and a half years, particularly around consumer. And then it, re and then it regained its speed. And uh, that was, sure, 2004 is when what I call the, the uh, startup industrial complex began where startups became a thing where people started publishing blog posts about them where you know prior to that the only entrepreneurs were crazy people people who couldn't get a job anywhere else now it became a reasonable thing to do harvard started having entrepreneurial classes they didn't have it in the 90s this, right. you know you gotta understand like this was uh, this was not a thing and, and since 2004 with blogs and then video came and then of course 2010 or 11, we got the social network movie, which aggrandized the whole thing. <laughs> now we have this flowering of VCs, flowering of startups. It's a whole new world. And yeah. so this is now the soup into which we find ourselves. And, and, uh, and plus, we've got the AI, so now it's all dynamic. That's amazing. What do you think was going on in the heads of existing folks at sort of like industry leader levels as they were like watching what's going on with new technologies? We might be looking at folks who, yeah, perhaps it was like brick and mortar giant types, mm -hmm. who they have particular, maybe some IP on phone communications to make sure shipping is going on and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And then they begin to start hearing about, oh, people can put a credit card in online and buy a t-shirt from someone's store. Like, I don't need to worry about that. Right. To a point where they started to have to worry about it. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious if you have any commentary. Uh, yeah, it's really sports. different. I mean, 94, nobody believed. And it came out, came very slowly, and the incumbents all got killed. Mm -hmm. Sears and Roebuck, everybody but Walmart basically got eviscerated. On the retail side, you had, um, you know, giant companies doing hardware. They got killed if they didn't have an operating system that was part of their suite. Um, and you had all new sort of companies emerge from that period because the incumbents were asleep at the wheel. That didn't happen in 2008 when the smartphone came. Uh, you know, most of the billions that were created during the smartphone revolution between 2008 and 2018 really accreted to Apple and to Google because they were the ones that got the operating systems. Uh, but they were incumbents. They had been around for a while. They had been public for a long time. I think Apple's market cap was $40 billion, and now it's, what, $2 trillion. So it uh, made a big difference for them. Uh, and I think the same thing is happening here, but maybe even more in spades, is that the incumbents are not at all asleep in the wheel. They understand that they need to evolve and change and adapt with AI. They need yeah. to incorporate it into their existing products. They need to flower out into new products. So this is really a battle of, of the, the haves and the have-nots and, uh, and the hope-to-haves. It's everybody's going after the same thing this time. So it's fast, fascinating, super fast-moving, more fast-moving than the other two waves, for sure. What are observations you're making about um, what incumbents are doing now versus what they weren't doing? And this is sort of a, I mean, you kind of alluded to some things, which is maybe just general open-mindedness, adaptability, 
um, information gathering kind of things and also the willingness to start changing up and experimenting and then pushing to production some of these things. Yeah, I mean, it starts with taking things seriously. It starts yeah. with having some fear. And they didn't, the incumbents didn't used to have fear. They, they were very sanguine. They were very comfortable in their leadership positions and dismissive of startups. But now we've seen enough startups do really well that I think most smart leaders, even in the biggest companies, have enough fear that they can get their VPs and SVPs and directors and senior directors to actually take action with the new technology. I think that's the real difference is that the heads are scared and they've been able to convince the people down in the organization to be scared. And so I think the rate of experimentation you're seeing among the Microsofts and the Googles and whatnot is, is, um, is very fast. This is amazing. Yeah. So NFX has been observing some things with AI for, for years. Mm -hmm. I'm curious where you all have been thinking about and hopefully there's an A and B here between up until the end of 2022 and now the beginning of 2023 mm -hmm. with investment theses across some of the things you're looking at. Um, and preferably, you know, earlier stage companies and investments. Yeah. So look, I think the we'd known about the coming of AI for 30 years, right? I mean, Hans Moravec and Roger Penrose wrote the books in the early 90s about it's coming and this is what it might look like. So we've all known, we've been waiting. In the 2010s, most of our investments were in what we call deterministic AI, where it would say this widget is broken or it's not broken. It's not broken, let it pass through. It's broken, put it in the junk bin. <clears throat> and most of the revenues came from products that were doing that. When we saw GPT-2 and we could download it uh, to our own laptops and play with it, we realized, okay, game's up. The LLMs are working and it's gonna start accelerating. That was about two and a half years ago. That was sort of December 2019, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, when we saw that, November, December 2019. And so then we were kind of on notice that this is now a time to look at it. We didn't call it generative AI at that time, but yeah. we could see that you know, it was coming. And so we started making investments at that point in gaming companies that were doing stuff or uh, legal tech companies. And, and, and there are sectors that have hitherto been difficult sectors to invest in. Legal tech, gov tech, ed tech. They don't, compared to general enterprise SaaS, payments, insurance, and they don't return, those areas don't return as well. Uh, and so we haven't made that many investments in those sectors. However, with the arrival of generative AI, those sectors now become fertile soil because the difference between what was before and what can be is so vast that even those sectors that are slow to react yeah. have to react. And so we've been yeah. investing in, in those sectors in ways we haven't uh, for the last two and a half years which has proven to be a good idea. Uh, and so, you know, our theses on, on investing, there's a whole bunch we can talk about, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it looks at, you don't want to be in the front, uh, in front of the Microsoft and Google trains because they are going to be affected. They are going to use their distribution to push you out later. In the same way that an example people can relate to is probably what Microsoft Teams is doing with Slack. Yeah. Right? So they launched, they finally just cloned Slack you know, within 18 months, they were twice like, you know, cells. Yep. Uh, because they could just bundle it for free and distribution right. wins. And so yeah. uh, you have to understand that those areas that those guys want to own, they will eventually own them. Meaning you'll have a good run for a year and a half, two years, but eventually they'll st come and start taking those sectors and it'll be hard for you and it'll be hard for you. So we have generally been avoiding those areas. The other thing we've been avoiding is LLMs. These were very expensive four or five years ago to build. Now you can build them for almost nothing because you can pass data through the existing LLMs. Mm -hmm. uh, they are indeed going to shrink down, just live on your smartphone. You mm -hmm. won't need to go back to a server and pay anybody anything. You'll have open source uh, tools that are, are maybe 12 months behind the closed source tools. Yeah. And you just have to wait a year and then it'll be free. Uh, and so we've seen that coming for a long time. Yeah. We've known that about these LLMs. And so we haven't invested in any of those. Could they take their current position, could open AI, uh, take their position and build an application layer? Could they build an API layer? Could, possibly. Yeah. You know, could Jasper with their distribution using their wrapper where they've wrapped around some, some basic LLM, could they use their distribution to, to again, own the application layer and then really embed it as you would a, a SaaS product and build a long-term business? Yes, they could, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be hard. They're gonna have to really execute at a very, very high level. Um, and so we've stayed away largely from the wrapper companies as well. Um, we've been looking more at what we call uh, AI hidden inside, where people are buying your product because it's awesome. 
not because there's AI involved. Mm-hmm. And it's made awesome because it's got AI. Yeah. But it's kind of hidden in there. That, I think, has more longevity. The other thing we're looking at is what are areas that the big guys aren't going to want that are big niches yeah. that others haven't noticed. An example That's of right. that would be a company like EvenUp, which is a company we invested in two years ago. Morty Beller, my partner, uh, she invested in a company at Seed, led the Seed round, uh, in a company that was doing software for the personal injury lawyer industry. This is probably not an area that Microsoft and Google are going to put at the top of their list. Mm-hmm. You know, the personal injury lawyers, you know, the guys with the billboards. Yeah. Have you been injured at work? That sort of thing. Yeah. Well, it turns out that using AI, you can really accelerate the process by which those lawyers decide which cases to take, decide which cases to drop, and then actually executing on those cases using AI. And so they're growing like crazy. It was probably the hottest deal the last year here in Silicon Valley. They got seven term sheets. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll be announcing officially who won that, that, that competition. But uh, the information had a little article about it a few weeks ago. So this is a, is a sector outside of the central part of what we think of as, you know, like things at Slack or Teams or, or Excel. or That's the core of the world. And in that middle place, you're going to have a tough time as a startup carving out your own niche. But in those you know, sort of hinterlands, like personal injury lawyers, these are massive industries that no one has touched, but with AI suddenly become touchable, suddenly become sellable. Um, and so we're looking, we're looking heavily at that. Is this something to the, to the effect of now the value that's good at, you can create value that they're willing to pay for at a price that is profitable to you, because now you can do some of these things such as that processing. Right. There was, you know, there was, AI underwriting, fraud detection, things for credit card processing, and a bunch of these things, insurance claims, but it was kind of useless because you couldn't really keep the human in a loop on some of that, or you just had a lot of loss of quality. Or, or the only people who could use it were very technical IT people, and the yeah. number of organizations with that level of sophistication was just a small number. Small market, yeah. yeah. So you end it's up with you know, $400 million companies, a billion dollar companies, but you end up with real killers yeah. in that space. But now... Because of the English language interface, these things can, you know, apply to everyone in your organization and therefore are going to be worth a lot more. Plus, they do things you could have never done before. It just, no matter how good your software was in 2020, you couldn't do what you can do now. Yeah. And so those types of services, people are, so you're going to create all new businesses, whole new industries. And that's the third, that's the third sort of area that we're looking very hard at is sort of the breakthrough ones where, um, you remember when we first saw the mobile phone, I didn't immediately say, oh, that's going to transform the taxi industry. That wasn't the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, but after three years, the guys at Sidecar said, wait a minute, if we combine GPS with payments, with maps, and we apply it to transportation, that seems like a good idea. Mm. And eventually, enough entrepreneurs tried enough things that Sidecar figured that out, and then Lyft copied Sidecar, and then Uber copied Lyft. And that was the moment where we got this sort of big app that everybody recognizes the smartphone for. So, that same thing's going to happen with AI. That there's going to be a whole new industries, whole new applications. Mm. Hopefully on the consumer side, because look, consumers have been boring. You know, since DoorDash, I mean, what, what, what have we had? We've had Discord and TikTok. That's 12 years, That's maybe, or whatever, 10 years. We've had like two interesting consumer products, yeah. right? And remember, consumer was really interesting between 94 and 2013. It was still Snap in 2011. We had it in 2009 or whatever, 2010. So the consumer was hot, and then it just stopped. It's been yeah. so boring. You know, everything's yeah. been B2B for the last 10 years. Yeah. So now, hopefully with AI, we'll start to be able to do things that no one had even conceived of before. And those will create new consumer experiences and new products. And we'll, get, we'll get a new fresh world again. And that's, that's what yeah. we're doing. It's interesting because you commented on it very well. You don't want to be in front of like the Google and the Microsoft trains and things of that nature. Some of these tech giants have distribution. They have information that you don't have access to. And they have this team that will do what they need to when activated. This being said, uh, it seems pretty interesting because all the reason why they became tech giants is because they have all the consumer products you actually need, right? If you've seen the image of like, yeah. take your calendar, yeah. take your whatever, yeah. put it all, pack it all in there. Yeah. Well, it's because, you know, they, <laughs> all your needs as a basic human, a function, are basically taken care of. Yeah. Everything is like a little bit of a marginal whatever, and then you have adoption to download your native app or try to buy off Instagram. Yeah. But everything becomes maybe something like B two B two C play, yeah. advertise to Instagram or off Facebook to try to sell your your e commerce brand in stores, and that's just an uphill battle for the it solopreneur is. type person it is. or the underdogs here. It is. 
So in legal tech, potentially even health tech, some of the things you were mentioning here, one thing here is this, this friction to adoption for, for regulation perspective and also just the liabilities that maybe the chief of staff of a hospital will just never sign off on. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just to the layer of, I can handle my natural language processing tech tasks better as like a practitioner or a doctor because we've got this IP, but then you get into this whole thing of, hey, So what is with ed being? tech and gov tech and yeah. tech? And all and, and legal tech, all these areas that have been so hard to invest in, it's because these people feel as if they need to protect the end user. Yep, yep. And in the name of protecting the end user, they ignore innovation. They say if we if we implement this piece of software, they'll get a benefit of twenty, but the risk to them will be five, and it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. And the hassle to me as the administrator will be ten. And so I can use the risk of five as an excuse not to create the benefit of 20. Yeah. And so they have stymied innovation in protecting the end user. That's, they do it in that name, although they're really protecting most of their jobs and their own liabilities. They don't, before and they don't actually work hard and implement this stuff. Uh -huh. But now what we have is a situation where the value to the end user is not 20, but it's 100. And the math is just going to be too obvious. <laughs> they are going to have to implement this stuff because the end consumer, the end user, the end customer is going to get their hands on a video, they're going to get their hands on a demo, and they're going to demand that they have access to this technology. And the, and the people who are, have been blocking innovation today will not be in a position to block it anymore. It'll just be overwhelmingly positive for the end user. This is particularly exciting to me. Because that means there's this fertile territory in every vertical that could be captured in that, you know, there's something to keep in mind there. Um, I wanted to also ask from your earlier question about not being in front of the trains for, for the big giants. Do you see a world where at the end of the day, there's these core technology companies fighting for the best tech at this infrastructural and platform position in the market, right? You want to distribute your API to your LLM and charge for that sort of the selling the shovels kind of position you'll see in a market. Do you see a space when things become so particularly efficient and they've captured and they've continued to even skyrocketing more value and perhaps we're in more of an oligopoly of a society than we are now, that they start going a little horizontal with these like, because they have these brilliant engineers just on staff and now they're all being activated like overnight. You know, we saw like the Microsoft like volcano eruption of like the dormant activity going back to and what maybe a lot of our mutual friends may have been saying that it feels like a startup culture again yeah. which is the thing that excites every person when they get to big tech right it's like they want to be around innovation and disruption but then you get into a little bit more red tape and the you go from two version 200,000 to 200,001 and that's like a couple of years on your life yeah. versus now you're going one to ten yeah. in the company yeah. it does have the uh, the 200,000 car rolling yeah, right yeah. so i'm curious if you think they do want to latch on to these sort of r d or venture op teams or venture studio type teams in-house and they do go a little horizontal because they've got this infrastructure to provide that maybe it's the servers and it's the access to the compute and the access to the resources yeah. governing relationships yeah. and the way to sort of like make sure the policies are in amicable or favorable terms uh, so I'm just curious where you're thinking at, at that layer, if, for example, uh, NFX, you might be considering legal and health tech type of things again. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely have to go horizontal and they are going to go to their core businesses, which is just general operating businesses and their use of their software, because that's who their bread and butter is. Mm -hmm. And as you get further out, those, those customers are harder for them to sell into. They have a whole team selling into health you know, hospitals and doctor's offices. But that's a smaller part of the team. The bigger part of the team is selling into manufacturing and energy yeah. companies, automobiles, and you know, oil companies so, yeah. um, uh, that, that adopt technology somewhat more easily. Um, you, know, you saw Oracle do this back in the 90s where they got big and they got their database installed. And then they started buying PeopleSoft and they started buying big vertical companies to sort of grow out their suite of products that they can own that they can bundle. The same with Microsoft is bundling. So you, you start out with one thing, and then you figure out where you can bundle in order to grow the business. So absolutely, they're going to want to grab you know, different big pieces, like they'll want to grab a, uh, an AI-enabled workday. You know, th there's no doubt there will be consolidation there. Um, and I think that you know, startups could end up doing that. Like, I think you're going to see, we, we believe that you're going to see billion-dollar 
three-person companies. Wow. Because you're not going to need to provision AWS anywhere. You're not going to be able to need to provision your LLM. You're not going to need to provision. It's literally just going to be sales and virality and network effects and getting your stuff embedded. And, <laughs> and three people can move faster than 30 in many cases. And you won't need that many engineers because you're going to have copilot on steroids, on steroids, on steroids in a few years. Yeah. And, and, and so you won't need that many engineers. You won't need that many customer service people. You won't need that many salespeople. You know, and so three people will be able to grow if they find the right niche at the right moment with the right marketing. They will be able to grow unicorns. And uh, we're going to be publishing about that soon. But we see that future coming on. And those companies probably will get bought by uh, people with distribution who can then run that stuff through their distribution and no additional marginal cost. Mm. So we start we should start to see M and A activity pick up in another two years. But it's gonna be pretty low for right now while these organizations figure out what they want to own, what they can't own. It might take them two, three, four years to, yeah. to decide, well we tried that but it didn't work. This other company did better, now we'll buy them. But they're gonna try almost a lot of things. Plus, if you're Google or Microsoft we say, hey come work with me, I'll pay you a lot of money. I'll give you yeah. some great RSUs and I'll let you work in this small team doing this really cool entrepreneurial thing. You get to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, the aqua hires. I also think we'll see more aqua hires. The interesting thing. But there won't be aqua hires because the three people will actually be generating 50 or 100 million revenue. I guess my point. There'll be real acquisitions. Because right. three people will be able to build real businesses, not just aqua hires. An aqua hire, in my mind, is when they get acquired for 25K for the assets and then they each get salaries. That's an aqua hire. Gotcha. What I'm talking about is three people with 50 million revenue, 100 million revenue. Wow. And they're sitting on the leverage right there. Do you think they'll out? develop IP possibilities in these two years? Is it more like if you can move fast, enter the, some part of the market and capture a huge share of it, and now you have friendly, and this is because you're getting the first set of, you've gone through and sort of picked up your battle scars, being in the trenches for a couple yeah. of years to get those customers that are willing to adopt AI and yeah. get to a point where, and this takes time, yeah. you can, time subjective, but yeah. there's necessary things to, yeah. mistakes to make along the way, discoveries along the way. Folks are most willing to adopt AI in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? We just say, I'm going to demand that this is like mm -hmm. in the product. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're saying now that if it's just a great thing and AI is just under the hood, you don't mm -hmm. have to say things like AI enabled service. You just say, we do this. This is done better. Yeah. You might have a, if you're a three person unicorn, you could just be cooler like Beats. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Apple Very acquired cool. them for billions because they were cool. Uh, you could just be cooler in the market. Like Slack was pretty cool, right? So they got bought. Yeah. Uh, because everyone loved working on that product, even though it's entirely replicable. Um, you've got uh, a network effects you could build uh, mm -hmm. around things. You've got uh, you know distribution uh, that you could have that in, into a particular market or geography that the big guys are going to end up wanting. Mm -hmm. um, and you know it's possible that you you get one of these niches that is actually much bigger than everyone thinks, and you can go public. Yeah. And just do a standalone business. You never get acquired by Microsoft. Or Google which would be Public the most off. ideal, because then you can yeah. develop your own culture and your own way of doing things. Did your team follow a lot of the mid-journey story as it was happening? Mm -hmm. That's like case in point, Yeah, right? Exactly. They yeah. used Discord to distribute. Discord did their whole infrastructure network effect stuff. They kept the data loop back into the system, and they just kept pushing. And they were the smartest guys who were the Small most focused team. on that one, yeah. you know, not one thing. Well, everyone else was distracted by multimodal and everything else. They just stayed focused. Small team, seven figures in revenue weekly at a point there. Now they're able to do the white label stuff, and it's been pretty interesting to see that evolve. And I think that in itself is the thing that tells you, like, okay, there's just, there's no tide turning, like the tides have turned. Yeah. Like money in the ecosystem is going out to this other, this other node in the network of capital in the economy. So yeah. what's going on and why? Yeah. That's exciting. What can the everyday builder start building? How should they start thinking about their ideas from the get-go? Yeah. Why well, I see those two things of know your customers or talk to your customers and build product, right? Mm -hmm. You have all this language. Um, that's that's really but, but you mentioned that's really insightful and wise. <laughs> talk to your customers and build stuff. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's the advice. Well, it's it's more like the simplicity of that is because if you look at uh, we're we're very grateful to be an SF. Yeah. But the case of point is you see a person came with an idea, and somehow. The two, the two things on your to-do list right, on your calendar, there seem to be a lot of other things there now. Oh, <laughs> right? I see. It's like, why are you going to networking events? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Do you need to? Or can you, like, cold DM the 100 customers that you might have? Right. Uh, or 
go to that industry conference as an networking event because you're just talking to your customers there. If you're building legal tech, well, go to right. law departments and universities. Here Rather than going to the know? AI wine tasting in Sonoma right. uh, conference for fun, yeah. go to your customer's conference in Topeka, Kansas. Exactly. See what they're doing. Exactly. Okay. The, uh, anyway, this being said. So if that's what people need to be reminded of, then, okay, we're starting at a very, very low level. But okay. No, I'll, you know, I'll get to the point. I think, yeah, it's just like... Uh, you said it very well earlier as well. I think we are approaching the cost to production going towards zero, mm. right? Like I said, cost to generate code, media files. You yeah. can automate your social media activity just for daily posts yeah. and get in the algorithms. Yeah. And we've kind of been able to do that for a while now. Yeah. But now folks have that suite of tools where, what what is a hundred bucks a month in subscriptions from like just product hunt features and launches? Mm -hmm. You got a CMO, a CFO, a COO, yeah. and then you can be the CTO. Yeah. And then there's your C-suite team to build those three-person teams, like you're saying. Yeah. A double-digit dollar figure a month yeah. replaces some full-time functions in the organization. Yeah. Job functions, they're not the people, but yeah. individual tasks to take care of. Yeah. So if you know that, hey, to get 10,000 customers, these things, this list needs to be growing, and this activity needs to keep hammering it in there, and we have to mm -hmm. continue to work on a project in the meanwhile very quickly, mm -hmm. I mean, you can do that for the first month, and yeah. then you hit that goal, yeah. and you crush that milestone. So. Yeah, so what, yeah, when we get cloud from. compute, right, yeah. the cost of the hosting and the um, and the sending out of, of all of your software data drops, you know, 100x. But all the other business costs, salaries, office space, PR agencies, CFOs, like bookkeeping services, all that stuff stayed the same. Yeah. Which is why, even in the age of uh, AWS and Azure, uh, we have companies raising fifteen hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. And now, what's happened is all the other functions are going to start dropping a hundred x, right? Because of AI, and yeah. uh, and that's going to really make a bigger difference than even the hosting, did. because the hosting yeah. was one, you know, maybe twenty percent of. It. Yeah. So does the bootstrapper today that you see I'll be optimizing for revenue as opposed to having something proven, get runway, and then try to generate some sort of return based on whatever you can do either way. Okay. Either way. I mean look, if you found something that's super viral, yeah, and it's gonna get more viral if you don't charge for it, but you can see the long term in game you have a real network effect where you're gonna be defensible, go for it. Hmm. Do it. Go raise the money, go pay for your bandwidth, uh, and, and go grab that market. Uh, on the other hand, if you find something small that people are willing to pay a lot for right away, either a large number of people a small amount or a, a small number of people a large amount, uh, then that can that can work really well also. Uh, all of it, all of it's available. There's no a, a certain one way to do it. I, I would caution people against uh, thinking that it's the LLM that's going to differentiate you. I still think there are some people floating around who believe that. When we started hearing that last year, I was like, come on, guys. It's all going to be kind of free-ish. Uh, the LMs are going to be free, and they're going to be multivariate and, and whatnot. Um, uh, you know, there's some people who are saying where well, they're going to build an LLM for medicine and all. I'm like, okay, we'll see how fast other people can build LLMs for medicine. Like, they're going to they're going to be six months behind you with open source, and, and good luck with that. The other thing not to fall into is to think that you're going to have some sort of proprietary data source that's going to make too much of a difference, because you can syndicate data, you can steal data. If you're a competitor, if someone's a competing, competing with you, they can steal data, they can syndicate data, they can federate data, they can fake data, they can get one-tenth as much data but, but buy a license to yours and run their data through yours and it'll be so close to the efficacy of yours that the customer won't be able to tell. Wow. And the price will drop. So I, th there's been this discussion about, well, whoever has access to their own data sets is going to win. I don't, I don't buy it. Not in most cases. There might be a few cases where that's true, but it's going to be the rare, rare exception. Um, and so I would, I would encourage people not to feel like, well, I've got this proprietary data set of you know, kidney cancer from Israel with 24,000 cases, and no one's going to be able to catch me. That's bull. If I can, if I can cobble together 2,400 cases, yeah. and then I can yeah. buy a license to your LLM without you knowing it, and then run all the data through, I'm going to get something that looks just the same to the hospitals, and... They're, not, they're going to buy mine, they're going to buy yours, I'm just going to lower the price and you're going to have a tough time. So what, what is defensible is, is probably not the LLMs, it's probably not the data sets. It's probably the application layers and the workflows. 
It's the embeddings. We call it embedding. That's the main strategy where you embed these pieces of software in either a person's life or a company's life, and they just really don't want to rip it out and it works just fine. Uh, and be the first to do that. Uh, and is, then- Is the embedding sort of how acute or how, how much the person begins to say, I guess ultimately becomes reliant on what you're providing them? Yeah. Okay. That's right. That's right. You, so an example, again, would be Oracle. Once they've got their database inside the deepest parts of your organization, ripping it out, yeah. forget it. Right. You know, I'm going to retire before, you know, I'm only retiring in 20 years. Like, I'd rather not rip out Oracle. It'll still be there 20 years from now. Yeah, you know, this is brilliant. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, they, they charge me 25% more. I'm going to pay it yeah. every year. What am I going to do? The, the, the right. amount of disruption that it would cause my organization to rip Oracle out is just too much. Workday, same thing. Like these are embedding businesses that can be really good, and mm -hmm. they don't have necessarily network effects, but they have embedding. So we think this is going to be helpful for. And then, then we also think, of course, you know, the killer of all defense abilities is network effects. That's why we're called NFX. This stands for network effects, and, and building up those network effects with your users or with other companies, and getting getting that all working together is the other thing you should be looking for as you, you build these out. The other thing that I really want to caution people about is. Almost every idea you're having, uh, everyone else has as well. Uh -huh. I had some guys in my office this morning, and they were so excited about their big vision, and I just had to tell them. I was like, guys, you're the fourth one in the last 10 days with this same idea. And they just faces dropped. They're like, I th but, but I've been working on this for three years. Like, I know. But, you know, the storm has blown through, and now everyone can see that this is there to be done. You might have thought of it first, but now everyone sees it because it's so obvious. And I've had that conversation with people since September really? when this whole like up upward swing started. Yeah. That's why we published our market map on nfx.com. So if you type in AI market map on Google, the first link you get, I think, is ours. Maybe PitchBook is buying a sponsored ad above it or whatever. But you'll get to the, uh, to the NFX market map. We published it simply because uh, we'd been building it for two and a half years. And the founders I was talking to on the phone didn't believe me that there was literally 80 other companies with the same idea. They're like, I don't see them in market. And I've got 20000 a month in revenue. I had nothing three months ago. It's amazing growth. I'm like, it is amazing growth. And your customers do want it. But what does it look like 18 months from now or two yeah. years from now? Right. <laughs> because there's 80 other people. They're like, I don't believe you. You're, you're being mean to me. Like, I'm pissed at you for telling me that. I'm like, okay, don't be mad at me. Just click on this link and then tell me. L l look at all the other people doing this. Go to their, go to their websites. Find a new idea. Find a new space. Find a new open space nobody's in. And I, so that's what I've been encouraging people to do since September. It's just realize that I know it's exciting. It's right. so fun. It's, it's, it's every 14 years we get one of these new storms blow through, and you're in the middle of one, and you're capable, and you're knowledgeable, and you're ready to do a startup, and you're convinced. But if you have 20 other people doing the same thing, and 12 of them get venture-backed, none of you are going to have a good time 18 months from now. And in that real-time sort of, uh, we'll call it reactivity for the conversation's sake, um, that's something you can just pick up on immediately as an investor in the room, right? And you can see immediately, well, this time, because the, like you said, you have to be able to adapt and pivot and start exercise this entrepreneurial skill of stoicism in mm -hmm. times and say, yeah. if I don't have an answer to defensibility question, but I have the $20,000 of revenue, I know keep moving along and yeah. move with the wind because yeah. we know how to sail. Yeah. Um, yes, and you can totally decide just to keep going. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and, and, and build it from there. Yeah. But when it comes to raising money, it's going to be hard. So you have to figure out your path without raising money if mm -hmm. you don't want to keep doing that. Because investors, unless you break out, unless you're the breakout of the 20 or the 40 or yeah. the 50 who are doing this, then, yeah, Series B guys will throw 40 million bucks at you and off you go. But you have to be the breakout. Yeah. And getting the C investment in the Series A is going to be very tough given the competitive environment. And given that Google and Microsoft are about to announce stuff. Yeah. Open AI will announce stuff and you yeah. know, spook people. And, yeah. You know, and you might raise the three million dollar seat, but then you're probably gonna have to pivot. And that yeah. that's fine. That's fine. And if you get the right seat investor, they're gonna go along with that with you and they're gonna want you to do that. Uh, so you can pivot into more open space or cleaner air. As we're sort of recursively going lesser and lesser on these intervals of releases and everyone's building on top of other things and as well as better around software. Indefinitely, mm -hmm. but I'm curious how you're all thinking about time horizons on concrete terms uh, for things like when you would hope to get a liquidity event, and maybe you're even thinking about. And this just 
for now, the conversation's sake of... Can you think about five years ahead? Like, it's always been big. It's always been a car without anything in front of you, just mm-hmm. rear view mirrors to, to make decisions like this. But is there some something to be said for folks who can go through different investing models or expectation setting of, this might not be 10x or 100x, but it might get you 10x in a year, you know, if you're moving fast enough and you might want to exit your positions. And I know that's not necessarily the thing an LP wants to hear. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm a GP, so I'm a, I'm a yeah, venture yeah. capitalist. I used to be a founder mm-hmm. four times over. We at NFX and probably most great seed firms and, and Series A firms don't think in terms of the question and the way you asked it, at least. We think, how does this become 500x or 1,000x? How does this become a public company that is one of the pillars of society going forward because gotcha. anything less than that doesn't move the needle for us. If we make 10x or even 20x on our two and a half million, I don't care. Yeah. 20x times two and a half, you know, it's it's 50 million bucks. My fund is 450. It doesn't even, it's only one ninth of a fund. I need to return that fund five times. Yeah. So I only care if it's 100x. I want to go for the big one. Yeah. And I want founders who want to go for the big one. And if they don't, that's totally fine. They just shouldn't take my money. Right? They should go and sell their company for 25 million bucks and make their 6 million or 8 million, whatever it's going to be. Yeah. Pay their taxes and they'll end up with 5 million bucks. It's amazing. Life changing. Yeah. What what more do you need? And they should should go and do that. Uh, But that's not what we're trying to do. And so I think that there are going to be. I think for a while there's not going to be too many acquisitions because everyone's going to feel like they can do it themselves. They won't have reached their limits on what they can do. Uh, and and so there won't be a lot of motivation for the M&A people to go and you know, cure a big hole in the organization. The organization will just build that hole ourselves. We'll just fill that hole with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I don't anticipate there's going to be a ton of M&A in the near term because the whole Apple cart's been overturned, if you will. The whole table's been thrown over. and. Nobody knows what to expect. When we saw the internet come along in 94, you know, that was all, prior to that, we were doing, you know, just on-premise software. The software would be on servers, in your own closet, they'd be blinking lights in there, there'd be wires coming out of it. When we got the internet, we didn't really get SaaS until starting from 1998, 99, that's when it started to kind of bubble up, and we got Salesforce in 2000. But for the first five, six years, you know, it was mostly consumer stuff that we were doing and, and security stuff to make to make the internet bulletproof. Uh, but it it really took off, you know, sort of by 2003 and four. That's when all the pieces were in place. We had the fiber optics, we had the security, we had the SaaS concept, we had credit cards were working, we had digital photography and started working. Like once that was all in place in 2003 four, that's when it finally took off uh, in in a real way. And the same thing is going to happen. For AI, we're going to have a bunch of years where the pieces need to be in place, and then everyone will kind of understand and have a theory about where things are going. And so the CEOs will be willing to let the M&A people go do their work at that point yeah. because they'll at least have some white papers, at least have some buy-in from the board. They'll have a thesis into right. which they can invest. Yeah. Up until, up until that thesis point, everyone's just going to be chaotically building, which is the wonderful chaotic most opportune time in the world, which is where we are now. right now. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's but you're not going to get an early acquisition for 10x. That's not going to happen. That makes sense. You have to be committed. It seems really clear right now that like an important thing to index on from what you're thinking about your your current theses is is this embedding portion, right? As you're just talking about to go from seed or Series A to IPO, it's fundamentally true. Like, what was the difference with Uber? Whatever they did, they battle tested it, they, they imitated, duplicated, whatever. They did everything they can to make sure this was the mode of transportation you relied on to function in your daily life. Mm-hmm. They had the they were very quick for getting the B2B relationships set up as quickly as possible. That was like one thing that other companies forgot to do was like, who most needs this? Who needs to get to the office and get to meetings every day? Mm-hmm. Who's in a busy metropolitan area? Who has disposable <clears throat> income or it's justified to expense this to the company because that person's time and energy is so valuable to keep producing. Mm-hmm. They were very smart about sure. uh, the target audience, sure. for, at least for that stickiness in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, which, and stickiness is a term I use for, for what you're talking about. Yeah, with call it defensibility. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and if you type into Google NFX Uber, 
you'll get an article describing exactly what you're talking about, okay. a map and a video sort of explaining where they started and then all the defensibilities they added in okay. on their road, and you're talking about one of them. Yeah. Oh, this is brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Same thing with Facebook. If you go to NFX Facebook, you'll get an article about that. <clears throat> one, thing, one thing your listeners might do is type in NFX defensibility, and there's a series of articles about defensibility. It's another one called Reinforcement where it talks about where defensibilities come from. And in it, I describe the fact that prior to the internet, prior to digitization, there was lots of different forms of defensibility. IP, where your ports were, where your mines were, where the railroads were. Like, all these things contributed to your scale effects and your defensibility. But once everything became digitized, it kind of eliminated space and time quite a lot. And we really bo boiled down to four defensibilities, which was network effects, embedding, scale, and brand. And those survived in the digital age. And now that we've got AI, it'll be interesting to see which of the four survive. Because it might just be embedding. Or it might just be embedding in network effects. It might be brand. I don't know if there's scale. I mean, everybody, I think, pretty much instantly has scale. So I think scale kind of falls away. But maybe distribution. You know, maybe distribution comes back more into it. Yeah. You know, that you... you you own your defensibility is based on the fact that you just own that real estate so you can add in everything that comes next, right? Which is what, what Google sort of did. They had distribution through the browser, through the search, and so they could copy MapQuest and do maps. They could copy Yahoo Mail and do mail. They could copy, Google copied everything. They copied InfoSeq and their interface. They yeah. copied the business model from GoTo, you know, Overture, and then had to pay, you know, uh, fees because they violated their patents for copying their business model, and then they copied everything. And I used to give a lecture where I said they copied everything except AdSense. And then the CEO who had founded AdSense raised his hand and said, no, I actually sold my company to them. I'm like, okay, well, there you go. They, they've invented nothing. And so with using their distribution through search, they were able to then grow into all these other spaces, including you know, Word, competing with WordPerfect, and competing with Excel. Wow. Uh, you know, just copying everything that had already worked, but having better distribution. So. Brilliant. How can the entrepreneur today think about what are your mental models or maybe battle testing or, or sort of like strength testing an idea a person might have for achieving things like what well, these uh, well, might not be the same for, but embedding and distribution, things of this nature. Is there something that the person needs to know that these are unlocked uh, before just to go all in and build a product and getting it out there and you know, my personal name and putting out on the internet and building it public and trying to be very vocal it's, about what It's a do. great question. And the big picture on this is that entrepreneurs, particularly young ones, have all the advantages. They have grit, they have time, they have energy, they have smarts, they are current. They're not encumbered by the, the stuff they learned 20 years ago. Mm. Okay? But they have one disadvantage. And that one disadvantage is that they don't know the answer to this question because they haven't seen tens of thousands of companies the way investors have or older people have. And, uh, and so I would encourage them to battle test their ideas against people who might not like your ideas, who might be able to explain to you why it's unlikely to work. There's so many different little elements about what has made different businesses work, the timing or how close they are to the payments or the money, what what uh, what distribution channel they took advantage of? Like, there's so many little elements like that that very experienced investors or entrepreneurs who have done multiple multiple companies and have had friends where they've angel invested and have watched all those failures. Just you have to watch a lot of game tape yeah. to know the answer to what is more likely than not to work. This is exactly right. So, see your early career, and you're in high school or just coming to undergrad university. You're in this, but you're in. You're in that seat right now. One thing you might lack to begin with just to activate your, sorry, start unlocking everything is network effects, right? And that some of that for you as an individual taps into maybe a unique distribution method you might not have. So you're a Harvard alumni and you can tap into that channel anytime you want because there's, there's circles for that digitally that you can tap into at any point in time and the relationships you have just for living your life a little bit longer and do your things and yeah, sort so of a participating member in society as a whole. And maybe some of those folks are just wedded to their, their current workplace and things of that nature. So not thinking about, oh, why don't we do at why can't we do X using Y or something? Just that question is the thing that starts the journey, right? Yeah. So how can one build network effects in today's age and sort of yeah. attention deficit economy where it's like either, hey, I don't want to waste my time talking to this kid. Yeah. Um, it is a 
I guess great. Yeah. I guess that's so. Let me true. differentiate between three types of networks. Yeah. And, and okay. the word the word sometimes gets confused. So when we talk about network effects, what we mean is the more people use your product, the more valuable that product becomes to all the users. That property, that concept, we've figured out that there's 16 different ways at least, or discovering more all the time, of creating that that defensibility because no one wants to leave your product because your product is always going to be more valuable because more people are there. Yeah. Okay? okay. That network effects are about creating defensibility, about creating value for people so that they never want to leave and nobody can come in and compete with you. Viral effects mm -hmm. are about getting your current users to get you more users for free. That's a different playbook, it's a different concept. Those are viral effects, often confused. In fact, if you type, go to Google and type in NFX, viral and network effects, you'll get an article explaining this saying viral network effects are not viral effects because this is so often confused. And then the third type of network is the network of people you know. So if you're a young person, you're trying to build out, you're, you're doing networking and you're meeting people and whatnot. And that's a whole different other concept, which is who do you know, who are you going to get information from, who's going to put information on your dashboard so you can make good decisions in your life. Um, that's, that's a third concept. And so I want to just differentiate between yeah. those three. That's a great differentiation. I guess my question there is, how does number three happen? At what point does, mm -hmm. is there a threshold where you're over-networking mm -hmm. and you're forgetting the, the original question of trying to, to build. create number one and two? Yeah. As we have moved into this startup industrial complex over the last 20 years, there is a lot of startup theater that goes on uh, where people are pretend, they, they want the lifestyle of the successful startup person. And so they jump right to that those parties and right to the drinking and right to the, you know, trips and the buses and the, you know, whatever, the flights to Cabo, whatever, because you think you're living the life. Uh, this is a fabrication. This is a distraction. This is, this is a shallowness that people are, if, if you want to see a funny movie about this, it's called Almost Famous. And it describes the same thing in 1974 when being in a rock band became a thing. And, and people were pretending to be a good rock band and people were pretending to be groupies of a bad rock band. And, they were just bad groupies of a bad rock band because everyone was trying to fake it. Yeah. And we're getting a lot of that now. We're getting a lot of that now. I understand that people want the status and the money yeah. uh, and, and uh, the color, the excitement of startups. Yeah. But they want the end result. They want to be famous rock stars. They don't want to go through the suffering to become famous rock stars or to become successful. So we are definitely, as a, as a, as a world, fighting this challenge. And we are finding a lot of founders are over-indexing on the, on the networking, the personal networking, uh, the off-sites, the, you know, let's meet in Hawaii and do, do brainstorming, you know, this sort of garbage, um, versus, uh, you know, moving to the right location, like a San Francisco, and then just putting your head down, you know, for, for 10 hours, 12 hours a day, and then networking for one or two hours a day. Um, and then you know, going on hikes on the weekend to keep yourself healthy so you can actually do the work the next week. But when you go for those hikes, take one or two people and get to be friends with someone um, who's also in your industry, who can also give you some tips or tricks, like I can, um, like you can, um, Akil. So um, I, I, think, I think if your ratio is sort of you know, 12 or 15 to one in terms of building versus networking for yourself, that's probably the right ratio. That's great, I think. Um... We're not seeing that real time, but the, the folks who are, they're there, they're around. Yeah. Does there, um, this is great because I wanted to get into, if you, and you already shared a lot on this topic, but you're just very seasoned um, investor with a with ridiculous track record. I'm curious about like heuristics now that you have, and again, you've already started sharing some of them. Yeah if anything is beginning to already, since last September to now, yeah. beginning to become more salient for you uh, and some that you're willing to discard. I feel like the theses that we had last September after setting this for the last two years prior to that uh, continue to be the case. I don't feel bad that we didn't invest in the LMs yet. Maybe I will. I don't feel bad that we didn't jump on the rapper bandwagon. Uh, there's 100 companies doing each of those rapper ideas. Yeah. Um, they're all growing quickly. You know, one of the things we've noticed is is that if you can find, particularly in the business-to-business -business applications, an area where the AI can do a greater percentage of the job to be done, you're going to have bigger success in creating a, a viable business. Uh, you know, um, 
if you look at legal tech, these LLMs can do a lot of the job to be done in legal. And that's why we have four investments in the legal tech area and they're all doing very well. Um, wow. Because the percentage is really high of what they can do. Um, I think in, in other areas like scientific research, it can't do much yet. It doesn't have its own ideas. It can't create theses yet. It can't design experiments yet. Maybe it can in six months. But so you, you could draw a, a chart, which is amount of money being spent on something, and then percentage of the job that the LLM can do. <laughs> and what okay, you're, okay. if you map industries and ideas by that, the things in the upper right are more likely to be more fertile. Yeah, yeah. That's good two-dimensional analysis there. I've been thinking about, are we going to have a higher aggregate economy, like globally or even GDP-wise? Because we're just seeing the two simple things we all want, like more efficiency or more output. Best case, you get both at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Or, or it's I think we're absolutely going to get a bigger economy. We're just going to get more of everything. We're going to get more and better music, more and better films, more and better writing, more and better images, yeah. More better software, more better sales. Look, I mean, it might be that the AI will keep me from getting all these spam calls to the things that people want to sell me. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, just like with targeted ads on Facebook, you know, I like a third of them, right? 15 years ago, I liked one, t one fiftieth of my ads. Now I like a third of them. Oh, that's interesting. I'm not going to click, but I like it. Yep. Same thing might happen with AI to your whole day. Your whole work day might just become much more efficient because only the great things will find you and bug you. Yeah. yeah. So your attention will be much more productive and more enjoyable to you. Do you think we're hitting our or going to hit our biomechanical limitations as humans soon? Where okay, we have this much attention. We have room for this many people in our lives. Uh the sort of the hundred fifty number you've ever heard of that. We have yeah, the dumb this, <laughs> this much pleasure in my life yeah at a point, certain point where it just becomes like i just cannot sustainably keep on taking in new things new products do you think we'll be sort of bombarded at a level um as just people or to, is just consumption just increase indefinitely i think i think in our lifetimes consumption well it depends on how long how soon we get longevity and, and <laughs> yeah. but uh there, there's definitely a point about 40 years from now where biotech and iai merge and humanity becomes a really different thing. Wow. So you're yeah, gonna, yeah. We're, we're going to see that in our lifetimes. It's going to be very interesting because, you know, about 20, 25% of our fund goes into biotech, uh -huh. into synthetic biology, or tech bio as we call it, software driven biology. And we see the trends there as well. Uh, and, and so we, we are going to get to that point. But I, I do think over the next 10, 20, 30 years now, we're not going to reach any limit there. Where we are reaching, in, in terms of our consumption of new things, I mean, I mean, we are much less spiritual than we could be. We are much less satisfied in our relationship with the people than we could be. We are much less healthy in our bodies than we could be. And the percentage of people who have access to any of these things worldwide is a tiny fraction of the overall population, 8 billion, which will soon be 12 billion. So I think we have a long way to go. I think some of the last two decades of like marketing and in the name, I'm, and I appreciate capitalism, but in the name of sort of growth in that direction, you begin to start embedding insecurity and urgency to get the consumer to convert. Not common gun as good and bad, it's just a thing that seems to be clearly true. Um, and so we're at this state in terms of like a mental health condition across society and a lack of maybe some of this internal, internal wayfinding or um, groundedness. Yeah. So one of them is brand. Yeah. And I think that the term is going to be very important is trust. Yeah. Um, so trusting your providers for things, making sure this is just like, it aligns with me, I can build for my own self. Maybe these things are important. To you as an individual, as an entrepreneur, you brought that out, yeah. you found your tribe. Yeah. And with things like Patreon and other things of this nature, and sort of like the, the cost of distribution going towards zero at a consumer level of social media, folks and full-time musicians have lived off like a thousand or two, five thousand fans. They get concert tickets, they get some donations, a couple bucks a month, everyone's happy, and that's just enough for them to be satiated and they can afford an apartment and produce and engage and there's a dialogue going and everyone seems to be happy in these sort of local ecosystems unlocked by, or sorry, local economies unlocked by the internet. Yeah. Um, and Patreon does a great job here and take, deserves those dollars because they're connecting the service and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I'm pretty curious there where you're thinking with... Yeah, you're going to see a 10 or a 100 of that. Yeah, this is exciting. You're going to see more and more people making livings 
servicing smaller and smaller groups, uh, basically getting their own whales, and yeah. uh, and and getting a good living off of that. Wow, no doubt about it. I mean, you see people doing new you know, yoga retreats three times a year. They make twenty thousand dollars per retreat. That's sixty grand a year. They're living the life they want to live. They can do that until they're eighty because you can do yoga until you're eighty. Like, cool. Yeah. Know, I mean, you, you have hundreds of thousands, millions of people doing stuff like that, just providing these sort of experiences that other humans want. And we can now touch each other through the internet and through and the AI enabled is going to make us each better. So if you had a, a yoga instructor that wasn't particularly good before, the AI can assist her or him in becoming much better. And then providing that, that context for people and up leveling all of us in the middle of the bell curve, in the middle of the uh, power law, right? Yeah. So LeBron James was that good. And everyone else is, you know, below him or whatever. And then uh, the same thing is true for coders, and the same thing is true for magician, uh, you know, musicians. And now this middle part, AI, will lift us all up in terms of our design or musical music ability, whatever. make our voices right. sound better, whatever. Yep. We're all going to become pretty good. At yep. A lot of things. Improvement in anything is more of a function of like the volume, and that means like repetition and feedback. Like you're lifting, and then you have that resting time. Well, the growth is coming between that interval, that interval is tightening. Maybe it's coding and, and, or testing in any subject matter. You have immediate feedback loops with sort of a never ending one-on-one situation with a, an AI t- yeah. tutor or something. Yeah. That's just the AI tutor for everything. You. Exactly. Yeah. It's going to make us, give us superpowers. Is it more important, going back to this whole point earlier about cost to production or we're sort of asymptotically approaching zero to produce things. So with these four legal, legal tech investments, I'm curious to know, you know how much visibility you have on their day-to-day, their day-to-day or their mm-hmm. operations, or mm-hmm. even from a strategy perspective for what those companies are doing to hit those mm-hmm. 500 to 1,000 X, um, like, you know, move yeah. shots or something. Is it more important for how they sell? Like, do you have like content uh, to share on like how a person might be selling to mm-hmm. these users that become their first mm-hmm. customers? to then improve the output level capabilities of that product because they need that information for them to adopt. So maybe it's... Yes, you're talking about, is there anything different about marketing AI products uh, or selling AI products? And those, those two things are different, but uh, yeah. at this point, at this point, no. At this okay. point, it's the same business of figuring out what the benefits are to the user, focusing on the user, yeah. uh, and then finding different channels to get the message to them. Having your marketing be distinct from your sales, figuring out if your your product needs to be sold or marketed, like you know, all the all the basic stuff still seems to hold. This is a lot of sense. So you ran, I think the account was like four companies, at least publicly. Like you're kind of sharing about some of your stories over there. So from more like the breadth and depth of company operations experience uh, from the founder perspective and seeing various stage stages uh, in those seats, what? It's one of those things where you know, experiences teaches you these heuristics. Like you can't just like share some words because it's kind of like reading a tweet and thinking mm-hmm. you'll be a better entrepreneur. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. you, only, the words apply because you have an experience to attribute that in your synapses and yeah. it registers. But if you can, I'm curious to elaborate on the conversations you're having with your children because it seems like the most pertinent. Yeah, more than ever because you're sort of encouraging that there's something better to do as an alternative to college to a 17 year old. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think all my kids are going to go to college, but only because yeah. they want to party for four years. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, college is sort of the pinnacle of life in terms of living in dorms and going on road trips and yeah. having people your age and having people who are studying things that you'll never study, but they can teach you about it in a half an hour and you have the time to, to learn. I mean, it's a pinnacle life experience. I don't think people should, should miss. It's super fun. Uh, but I am letting them know that they don't need to go to college if they don't want, that that there's plenty in the world to do right now, and the world, particularly for the next three years, is just completely wide open for all sorts of experiments. Uh, where yeah. you could do something and just get lucky, and you know suddenly be doing something that really, really touches the world in ways that you couldn't have certainly 40 years ago, and and and, and in 2014 was really hard, and now it's a lot easier during this open period of AI. So uh, I'm I'm encouraging them to think up their best thoughts and and you know run them by me. Uh, and we'll see if any of them stick. And look, uh, my, my thing is that I have about 81 ideas a day, and about every two weeks I have a half a good of, uh, an idea. <laughs> but it's really that ratio. So, d- you know, so uh, you have to have hundreds of, of ideas before you stumble into a good one. Right, that makes sense. Again, you, under, you have six ideas, but it doesn't mean that three or four are good. 
Yeah. It's, it's unlikely that any of them are good. To sort of just function as a human so you're sustaining yourself and enjoying like the ride of life. Uh, I'm, I guess there's something there right now where I was seeing there's like a dozen new incubator, not new, but just yeah. incubator things popping up or say there's a new big brand they've never done this before, but Gen AI is just too, too juicy, big to ignore. Yeah. Uh, like AWS running a summer camp type thing for an accelerator. Like, yeah. When were you doing an accelerator? You know, right. Like, no, they are. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Right. Great. Like use cloud services or something like this. And it's just a fun, right? Like, oh, it's why so not, fun. Why not throw a few million bucks and just like make something happen with your little incubator cohort. But the value added as an alternative to something like school is you get this lean, small enough, but big enough, intimate environment where you're living in a new spot, new world, new environment, mm. new social circle. Everyone's excited and giddy about what they're up to and they can passionately exchange some of these things over, over hikes or something like that. Um, that's life experience. I'm curious if you think education is going to move in a direction like that. Where it's I hope it does. Experience. I hope it does. And I think that these okay. accelerators, I think that these incubators, I think all these programs you guys are running and doing and getting involved with are just delicious. I think they are just incredible for the participants and, and even for the people running them. Uh, and so I would encourage any young person, if you can get into one of these things, just do it. You awesome. know, just do it. Yeah. Is there something about not needing to be in San Francisco in your head. I know this right now there is, we're talking about this, a clearly like sticky network effect thing here. Yes. That's just like the, the information efficiency is just absurd and, yes. and the, the way to unlike get these little points of, okay, met the investor, or met the met the co-founder, met the so-and-so person, yeah. my first customer is like, yeah. it can just happen here if you're focused and you know what you want and you're communicative about it and you know what you're doing. Yeah. You can do that unless I'm out there. Like I've seen it happen several times. So if you're in a different country, um, whatever, like agnostic to whatever the country might be, um, what what would you do if you just kind of had to start from scratch, knowing everything you know in your in your life right now? I, you know, we're sitting here in San Francisco, and I feel like we're very lucky to be here. Uh, but I also moved myself here, mm -hmm. even though uh, my family's all back east. I moved here because of the network effect, because of the culture here, because the advice you get here is just better. You don't get that much bad advice and you get a lot of good advice. Uh -huh. You get a lot of learnings, you get a lot of key performance indicators from people who are doing something slightly different to you. But when they tell you those numbers, you now can move boldly and clearly with your own product and your own business. And that changes the game. The, the, the little mechanics of how the network effect of the tech industry in San Francisco or, uh, you know, how it works is, is magical to watch the little pieces of the mechanisms, but it's real. It's yeah. absolutely real. And so, you know, look, if I want to really play basketball, I move to the United States. If I really want to do tech, I move to San Francisco. If I really want to do movies, I don't do it in San Francisco. Yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna you know, kid myself. You know, I could go down a list of all the great movies made in San Francisco, but that's not where they're made. Right. They're made in Los Angeles. Yeah. The screenwriters are down there. The way you light it is down there. The agents are down there. Everything's down there. You know? And if I'm going to do finance, I don't do it in Los Angeles. Yeah. I do it in New York. Because right. that's where all the great hedge funds are, and that's where the banks are, and that's where the investment bankers are, and the merchant banks are there, and the ratings agencies are there, and the journalists are there. So if I want to do finance, I go there. And if I want to do tech, I come here. It's pretty simple. Nice. Cool. I'm feeling pretty satiated with the conversation film like there's just a lot of value here i think the the, the continuous reading like the the amount of stuff that the nfx provides for free is um is mind-blowing to me um how have you thought that in terms of being the gp there have you all he's been very very clearly community driven first yeah. and community like you know what we're doing here with super bowl valley it's it takes a lot of sacrifice uh, on the teams and yeah to make things work because it's not it's a labor of love and you enjoy it and sure there's like commercial opportunity directions you can take things but to sustain it and keep it there it just takes a sort of this this free yeah, you don't do it for unexpected money. thing you yeah yeah no, exactly i mean look i was very successful with my four startups i don't take a salary at nfx i'm doing it for love mm. uh, i think all the partners are mm. um, we don't need to be working but we love it and we love helping people uh, you know, get better. And, you know, the selfish part of it is that if we can educate people to think about how to do companies better, 
design the better, then there'll just be more companies that we can invest in. And the pie just gets bigger for everyone. And that's, I think, one of the big things people underestimate about why you would move to San Francisco is there's a, a pie is bigger mindset here, yeah. as opposed to a, a taking my piece of the pie, which is more East Coast thinking and more European thinking. And the small brain switch, it's not a small brain switch, but it's, it's a huge impact when people move from, I'm here to grow the pie, I'm here to grow the pie. Once you start growing the pie, there's plenty of pie for everybody. And I've had plenty of pie handed my way during my career. Um, and for the next 20 years, will continue to flow my way simply because I have it flow out. You, know, you pay it forward. And that mentality is what created Silicon Valley and what I think is, is maintaining us. And to the extent that we get lost in the pursuit of money and status, that's where we're going to lose. That's where Silicon Valley, as we know, will end. And so we have to stay focused on the paying it forward, and we have to stay focused on the products and the metrics. Products, metrics, and paying it forward. And if we do those three things, then we will stay who we are and we will continue to be the center of the world for tech. And if we lose ourselves in money and status, then we're lost like everybody else. Definitely. That was the best. I'm going to call the closing remark. <laughs> that was <like> beautiful. <laughs> Man, Jess, I really appreciate your time. Of course, thank you.